Hello, good morning. We're so glad that you could join us today. Today we draw close our online Bible study out of the Gospel of Luke. We began this series way back in February of 2021, and today marks lesson number 74, our final lesson out of the Gospel of Luke. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 24. After today, we're going to take a two-week break, and then on August 31st, we are beginning a brand new live online Bible study out of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. You know, the church at Corinth in Paul's day had much in common with the church in America today. God has called his church to be in the world and to not let the world be in the church. We have a lot of churches where the world has gotten into the church. So, 1st and 2nd Corinthians is timely for our generation. I hope that you'll join us beginning on August 31st for this brand new lesson series out of Paul's writings to the church at Corinth. But today we bring our time together from the Gospel of Luke to a close. Luke chapter 24. You know, most biographies of great men end with their death and their burial, but not Jesus, because he is alive. And though we may have come to the end of our study of the Gospel of Luke, the title of this last lesson is, It's Not the End, It's Just the Beginning. Because Jesus isn't finished. He will ascend to heaven and send the Holy Spirit to give birth to the church. You know, in reality, the Gospel of Luke is really just part one of the book of Acts. Um, Two weeks ago, we finished in Luke chapter 24, verse 12, with the empty tomb of Jesus. And starting in verse 13 last week, we read the account of Jesus appearing to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Today, we're going to begin with verse 36. And this morning, we're going to read four sections of these final verses as we introduce four tremendous truths about Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36, we read these words. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And then skipping to verse 36, uh, uh, 38, and he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt as arise? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have ye any food here? So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, here's the first truth that we can glean out of this passage. Jesus offers you peace when you are troubled. You know, these disciples were frightened when Jesus suddenly appeared to them. They thought they were looking at a ghost. So Jesus invited them to investigate and to touch his wounds. Now, here's a good Bible trivia question for you. What are the only man-made things in heaven? The answer is the wounds of Jesus the nail prints in his hands and his feet. They were still there when Jesus was resurrected, 
And according to Zechariah, they'll still be there when Jesus returns because the people of New Jerusalem, the saints, will recognize the scars and they will ask the question, what are these wounds in your hands? The disciples were terrified when he appeared. The first thing Jesus said to the disciples was, peace be unto you. Now in the Greek, it's just two words, literally meaning peace, y'all. <laughs> and then he asked them a question, why are you troubled? The word troubled literally means to be stirred up with distress. Jesus asked us the same question today. What is it that's troubling you? What is it in your life right now that's causing you to be stirred up with distress? What are you losing sleep over? The disciples thought they had seen a ghost. I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, We are born naked, wet, and hungry. <laughs> then things get worse. <laughs> you know, life is tough. Jesus never denied that. In fact, he told us that we'd face plenty of trouble, but that's okay because he can give us peace in the midst of a troubling world. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The disciples were afraid because they had thought they had seen a ghost. Now, what's happening today is even more frightening than ghostly sightings. We have attacks on our foreign allies and threats of more terrorism and an escalating Mideast crisis and a lingering pandemic. Add to that the daily stress of modern society with its rising prices and tough marriages and taxes and bills and rebellious kids and hot water heaters that decide to burst on a Friday night when plumbers charge time and a half. All of this is enough to drive a person to eat a gallon of ice cream. There's something better, though, than ice cream. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, but he's fat-free. Would you like to have the peace that only Jesus can give? You must do the same two things the disciples did that night. First of all, peace comes when you examine Jesus. You know, Jesus invited the disciples to check him out. The Christian faith is not just some blind leap of faith into the darkness. It's always invited honest investigation and study. Jesus told these disciples to look and see. Instead of focusing on their fears, Jesus told them to focus on him. They were still in danger of being arrested and executed. In fact, almost all of them eventually died by execution. But Jesus said, I can give you peace in the midst of your fears. If you spend your time focusing on your difficult, unpleasant circumstances, you'll constantly be stirred up and troubled. But if you will focus your gaze on Jesus, you can find his peace. Now, there's a wonderful little song that we sing around here sometime that simply says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Next, we see peace continues when you experience Jesus. Jesus not only said, look at me, he reassured them that he was real. He said, go ahead, touch me. And he said, handle me, for a ghost does not have flesh and blood. Now, he notice here, he further proved his reality by snacking on a piece of fish. Now, we may not know too much about our resurrected bodies, but since we're going to be like Jesus, it's a pretty safe bet to say 
that we're going to be eating in heaven. Jesus invited them to touch him because there's something reassuring about touch when you're afraid and troubled. Um, I heard about a little boy who was in his bed, and he had been frightened by a midnight thunderstorm. And he called out for his dad to come in there to his room because he was afraid. And the sleepy dad just kind of wandered into the room and he hugged his son and said, son, you don't have to be afraid. Why did you call me? Don't you know that God is with you? And the little boy said, yes, sir. I know that God's here. I just needed someone with skin on. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually reach out and touch Jesus? Don't you think that that would give you some peace? The physical presence of Jesus is no longer here. He ascended back into heaven. But he hasn't left us without the comforting assurance of a physical touch. He provides that through the people who are here in his body, the church. Today we are in the arms of Christ, the hands of Christ, the feet of Christ. And when we reach out and shake someone's hand or we give them a friendly hug, it's the hug and the touch of Christ. That's why watching church on television or online is never going to be a substitute for actually being there. There's no personal touch. And as we become an increasingly high-tech culture, the church must become a high-touch gathering where we pass out hugs and handshakes. Maybe you need the love of a local body of Christ for you to experience the life of Christ that leads to peace. Now, the second tremendous truth that we learn about Jesus is found in verses 44 through 46. Look what it says. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. The second truth that we can learn is Jesus can open your mind to scriptures. Have you ever been confused when you've been reading the Bible? See, it's easy to get confused when you read something. Here's an actual statement printed in the Lewiston, Idaho Tribune. It said, the crossword puzzle, which should have appeared in today's Tribune, appeared instead in yesterday's, together with the answer to the puzzle that should have been printed yesterday. Therefore, the puzzle that should have appeared yesterday is in today's Tribune, together with the answer to Wednesday's puzzle. The puzzle for today and the answer to the one that should have been printed yesterday are reprinted. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty confusing. You know, when some people read the Bible, they're just as confused. Jesus opened the minds of the disciples of the, to the Scripture by telling them that he fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies. The Messiah had to suffer and die in order to be raised from the dead. You know, the religious experts studied the Old Testament religiously, but they were missing the point because they didn't understand that Jesus was fulfilling it. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus told them, study diligently the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. You know, the Bible shouldn't be confusing to you. It becomes more, much simpler to understand when you possess the key to unlocking it. And the most important scripture key is, uh, is this. All the Bible is about Jesus. You can find Jesus 
on virtually every page of the Bible. If you read the Bible and you don't find Jesus, you better read it again. Do you have a hunger to read the Word of God? Do you want Jesus to open your mind to the Scripture? You know, sadly, most Christians spend more time watching TV than they do reading the Bible. I came across an interesting poem not long ago. It says, on the table side by side, a holy Bible and the TV guide. One is well worn, but cherished with pride. Not the Bible, but the TV guide. One is used daily to help folks decide. No, it isn't the Bible, it's the TV guide. As pages are turned, what shall they see? Oh, what does it matter? Turn on the TV. So they op open the book in which they confide. No, not the Bible. It's the TV guide. The word of God is seldom read, maybe a verse before they fall into bed. Exhausted and sleepy and tired as can be, not from reading the Bible, but from watching TV. So then back to the table, side by side, it's the Holy Bible and the TV guide. No time for prayer, no time for the word. The plan for salvation seldom is heard. Forgiveness of sin, so full and so free, is found in the Bible, not on TV. You know, if you don't open the Bible on a regular basis, he's not going to open your mind to scriptures. Study them diligently and you'll find Jesus there. Let's move ahead to the third tremendous truth about Jesus we find in Luke chapter 24. Beginning in verse 47, we read, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The third truth that we find in this passage today is that Jesus provides power to be his global witnesses. You know, Jesus told his disciples they had a big job ahead of them, preaching, er, preaching repentance and forgiveness to sins to all nations. Now remember, this was just a ragtag group of ignorant and uneducated men. And Luke finished writing his gospel account in just a few verses. But later, he wrote what we call the book of Acts. And when you combine Luke with Acts, you find that Dr. Luke, a Gentile, was responsible for more words in the New Testament than John or even the Apostle Paul. In the first chapter of Acts, you find that Luke repeats some of his details in Luke chapter 24. He writes of Jesus appearing after the resurrection and giving the disciples definite proofs that he was alive. And he, again, he gives them the command to wade into Jerusalem until they get the power. Now, the key to this power is the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus says, John, speaking of John the Baptist, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with, literally with, the Holy Spirit. And just as John submerged people into water, Jesus promised his disciples that they too would be immersed totally, totally submerged in the life of God through the Holy Spirit. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about the last words of Jesus on the cross. But his actual last words are found in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. Now, the word for power is the word duminous. 
from which we get our English word dynamite. And indeed, we read that 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were praying and they heard the sound like a mighty rushing wind and flickers of flame appeared above their heads and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And Peter stood up and he preached and 3,000 people were saved and baptized that very day. And within three centuries, Christianity has spread throughout the entire Roman Empire, and today the gospel is being preached in every nation. Now, how did these few disciples turn the world upside down? Or maybe they turned it right side up for Jesus. They had the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the promise of power that Jesus gave to the disciples is a promise to you and I today as well. You and I must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's at least two reasons why you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. First of all, God's Word commands it. You know, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 says, "...don't be drunk with wine, which leads to excess." but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, when a person is drunk on alcohol, they're under the influence of the alcohol in their bloodstream. And that person will talk differently, and they'll do things that they might not ever do while they're sober. But when a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit, we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and he controls our speech. He controls our actions. And the infilling of the Holy Spirit is not some add-on option like a moonroof and a new car. It's an absolute essential in the Christian life. Have you ever been filled with the Holy Spirit? You can say, can it happen and you not know it? Well, that's like saying, you know, you can get married and not know it. Not just on Pentecost, but several times in the book of Acts, Luke writes of the disciples being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't always speak in some different language, you know, tongues, but they always spoke about Jesus. And the way you can tell that you are filled with the Holy Spirit is that you're going to be witnessing for Jesus. Jesus says, out of the abundance of a person's heart, the mouth speaks. You know, in the country, we used to say, what's down in the well will come up in the bucket. The second thing we see here is, is that God's work demands that we be filled with the Spirit. You know, you cannot witness without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't forgive people who have hurt you without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't be the kind of wife or the kind of husband that you should be without the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason we have so many powerless, defeated Christians in our churches is that people are trying to live the Christian life in the strength of their own flesh. And it always leads to frustration and defeat. Jesus has given our target audience the entire globe. John 3.16 does not say, For God so loved the people in Jerusalem, or the people in Israel, or the people in America. No, it says, For God so loved the world. And the only way we can take the good news to the ends of the earth is by the power of the Holy Spirit. My friend... You need to visit Calvary to have your sins forgiven through the death of Christ. You need to visit the empty tomb so you can affirm that Jesus is the risen Lord. But you also need a Pentecostal experience in which you receive the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. Like the beautiful old Church of God hymn says, Lord, I would be wholly thine, I would do thy will divine. From the world and sin and self I would be free. 
On the altar now I lie, and with all my heart I cry. Let the holy fire from heaven fall on me. Let the fire fall on me. Let the fire fall on me. The fire of Pentecost, consuming sin and dross, let the holy fire from heaven fall on me. Finally, let's look at the fourth tremendous truth we find in our passage here in, in Luke chapter 24. Verse 50 says, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. The fourth truth that we find here, Jesus can replace your sadness with joy. You know, after the crucifixion and before the resurrection, the disciples were people without hope and without joy. But when Jesus appeared to them alive, their hope was restored. And then Luke tells them that Jesus, uh, G Luke tells us that Jesus took them to a spot on the Mount of Olives near Bethany, and slowly he began to ascend into heaven. And in Acts chapter 1, we read that the disciples stood there watching Jesus go up into the sky until he was obscured by the clouds. Two angels appeared to the disciples and said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And then Luke tells us that they worshipped him. This is the first time that we are told that the disciples worshipped Jesus. Jesus has said, you shall worship only the Lord God. And that's exactly what they were doing. Then we're told they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising God. They were filled with joy. Their grief and their sadness were transformed into joy. Is there joy in your life today? Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Are there people and circumstances in your life that have robbed you of your joy? Jesus is able to do the same thing for you that he did for those disciples. He can turn your sadness into joy. Isaiah wrote, when the Messiah came, he would have a specific ministry to those who mourn. We read in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, For those who mourn, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. You know, ashes on the head were a sign of deep mourning and grief. But God can replace your ashes of pain with a crown of beauty. In the Old Testament, oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. God wants to anoint your life with the oil of gladness to cover your mourning. You may be struggling with the spirit of despair. Things aren't going so well. And you don't think they're going to get any better. He offers you a garment to put on. It's the garment of praise. Jack Taylor used to laugh about people who, when you asked them, said, hey, you know, how you doing? They'd reply, all right, under the circumstances. And he would say, well, what are you doing under your circumstances? You know, circumstances are like a mattress. If you get under it, you'll smother. But if you get on top of it, you can rest. The joy of the Lord lifts you above your circumstances. Now, joy is not necessarily the same thing as happiness. Happiness will come and go. Your happiness is dependent upon happenings. And when things are happening good, you're happy. When they're happening bad, you're sad. 
but joy is dependent only on Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Happiness is like a thermometer. It only measures elation. Joy is like a thermostat. It determines your attitude. When you meet the living Christ, you won't have to be a wit try to be a witness. You'll naturally be a witness. Back a number of years ago, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the baseball team, won the World Series. And their leading pitcher, his name was Oral Hershiser. He was named the MVP of the World Series. Just before the final inning of the World Series, the television cameras zoomed in on Oral Hershiser in the Dodgers' dugout. He was standing alone, but he was obviously saying something. A few days after the series, he appeared as a guest on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Uh, for all of you kids who wondered who in the world Johnny Carson was, uh, he was the host on The Tonight Show before Jay Leno. Uh, Johnny Carson asked Oral, Oral Hershiser what he was saying in the dugout before the final inning. And Hershiser says, I wasn't saying anything. I was singing. And he he said, Johnny said, you were singing? He said, I didn't know you were a singer. And Oral Hershiser said, I'm not. But Johnny Carson uh, persisted. He said, well, what were you singing? Why don't you sing it for us tonight? And Oral Hershiser said, nah, you know. But by that time, the audience was just chiming in, sing, sing, sing. Finally, Oral Hershiser began to sing. And when he did, it got quiet in that whole studio. He sang these words, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, it was deathly quiet for a few seconds after he finished. And then the audience started applauding loudly. See, that's what happens when you know Jesus. You won't be ashamed to tell the whole world how much he means to you. That's what the disciples did. And because of that, it wasn't the end. It was just the beginning. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this day. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have had as we've gone through the whole entire book of Luke. Father, we have so much enjoyed our journey, and we've learned so much on the pages of these many passages. Lord, there's been a lot of things that we have covered that have been familiar to us. There have been a few things that maybe were not so familiar to us. But, Father, most of all, we just pray that we would become more like Jesus. I pray today for anyone who is watching me in this video. I pray, Lord, that you would just be with them, help them to see Jesus in the pages of Scripture. Father, more than anything, we would love to see folks come to know you as their Savior. Father, today we pray for your help, and again we thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining in today. This coming Sunday, we are continuing our sermon series out of the New Testament book of Hebrews. Our theme for that series is Fix Your Eyes on Jesus, and that phrase comes to us out of uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 where it says let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and finisher of our faith and we're so excited to to share this series with you and I hope that you'll join us we hope that you can join us in person but if not you can watch on Facebook or on YouTube the message will be posted sometime around noon now, don't forget, we're going to be taking a break for the next two weeks. 
And then we're going to be back on Wednesday, August 31st at 10.30 a.m. for our brand new online study out of 1 Corinthians. If you miss any of the lessons or any of the sermons, you can check them out on Facebook or you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Thanks again for joining today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you on August 31st.